Romans chapter 10. Romans So, Romans chapter 10, and brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And we have here matters of true prayer, true prayer. Uh, we, we were on the subject of prayer this morning, and I didn't realise we would have the two together quite, but this morning... The prayer in Acts was where the Apostle Peter had been imprisoned and the people prayed fervently for him. And the prayer was answered even, they prayed in faith, I'm sure, but yet it surprised them all. It surprised Peter and it surprised them. Yeah, it's in Maybe the that it was answered so quickly. Um, bad. Uh, but we should pray. And there are times when we may not have as much faith but if we pray we should we are meant to pray without wavering and to pray in faith but of course we don't actually know the outcome of our prayers when we ask exactly how things will uh, come to pass but here we have a rather different sort of prayer but an important one because it's a heart's desire prayer it is like in chapter 9 having a great heaviness and continuous sorrow in my heart. I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. A desire for uh, the, the apostles' own people, the people of Israel, to be saved. Uh, th this is the word that is used. They weren't saved. He, he desired them greatly to be saved. Their saved person is saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and this was his desire for them so a great subject of prayer is that people should be saved it's a great thing to pray for that people will be saved and there may be reasons that we might be hesitant to do to do that and one very good author on the prayers of the Apostle Paul he says uh, A.W. Pink, his name, that in fact Paul doesn't pray for the salvation of others. But here he clearly says that it is his prayer. I think this may be the exception. There, there, there are other instances in the scripture. Uh, for example, the Lord Jesus in his death, for his Father, forgive them. And also, um, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen was being stoned to death, he was asking for the forgiveness of those that were stoning him. In Acts chapter 7, similar, if you like, prayer to that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Unreason for stoning him. Yeah, they hated to hear the gospel. Oh. They really hated to hear of the Lord Jesus and particularly that they had been involved in the murder, in the crucifixion, but he kneeled down as they, were, as they stoned him and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Well, for it not to be laid to their charge, they had to be converted. They had to turn to Christ and have their sins forgiven. And that would happen, of course, to the Apostle Paul who was there at that time. So there it should be a heart's desire, desire for the salvation of others. As we sang in... Psalm 67. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look at it in the in the in the version in the Bible. Psalm 67. It says, "God be merciful unto us and bless us, and cause His face to shine upon us, that Thy way may be known upon earth, Thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise Thee, O God." Let all the people praise thee. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, I, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. 
That is a distinct prayer, a missionary prayer, Psalm 67, for all the people of all the nations of the earth, to, for God to allow them to praise him. He, he must save them, he must convert them. It's his saving health, verse 2 of that psalm, that is prayed for. So when uh, people occasionally say, look, we don't know who is to be saved. Why are we to pray uh, for the salvation of anyone? Leave it up to God. Just get on with preaching the gospel. But here there is clearly indications in the scripture. Isaiah says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens and come down. And in, in that's Isaiah 64. And in, um, I was looking up, Habakkuk, or well, some people say Habakkuk, don't they? But there are two K's, Habak Habakkuk. Um, there in the Old Testament, in chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. These are prayers for God to revive his work and to save many souls. So, prayer for the salvation of people is not, I have to emphasise this because we need to remind ourselves of it, I think, pray for people to be saved. As Paul, his desire that they might be saved, it was his heart's desire, a fervent prayer. Wouldn't we love uh, lots of people coming to church, needing a new big building because there are so many people being saved and wanting to worship God together. Isn't this what people are made for? They're made by God, in the image of God and for God. To worship God and if people are lost they're in danger of hell it's a miserable miserable condition people need to be saved uh, 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 need desperately desperately no Des it's a great need so it's not really um, no reason why they don't be saved yeah well we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it now we'll talk about it now so th let this be our prayer for people to be saved Israel is mentioned here it was Paul's prayer for Israel so it must be our prayer for Israel that the people of Israel will be saved now there's reasons why they're not all saved yet but that's a prayer for them but what about he's praying for his kinsmen those according to the flesh close his, his loved ones that's why he's praying for them his, maybe he's his got brothers and sisters maybe he's got parents maybe he's got uncles and aunts and cousins and they're going without God they're living basically without although they're part of a religion they're separate from God completely separate they need to be saved from their sins that separate them from God they need faith in Jesus Christ and he's, this is his heart's desire uh, is it our heart's desire for people to be saved today it really must be it's so important and uh, if it's not our heart's desire if it's not our prayer that people will be saved, we're going to find ourselves very lukewarm about the wonders of Jesus Christ, about the wonderful things that he can do. It's, it's very important. Uh, we might have slipped in this. We might have once become a Christian and been very excited about Jesus Christ saving me. This is our, the person that becomes a Christian. They can say, I've been saved. I've been saved by faith in the blood and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I, I, I've got nothing in myself. It's all in him. And I have this great joy in the Lord. But as we speak to people about it, so often, they don't want to hear. So many of them are opposed. There's so much, neg talk about negativity, there's negativity towards Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear about a saviour. They want to continue in their miserable lives as if they're quite happy when they're actually not as happy as they're pretending to be they're without God they're in a very 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 you say that a thousand times very serious serious condition a person going through life without being reconciled to God is in the most dangerous place they could be uh, have a great pension living in a big house they could have got friends and family or cheering for them like we had of Herod this morning but they're in the danger that Herod was in that, that they could be struck down at any moment 
and they stand before God and all they've got is their sin. All their good works don't count for anything. I'm sorry to say it, but God, a single sin will keep someone from heaven. They need Jesus Christ, the Saviour. So it's a most serious matter that people should be saved. So this is an important, very important subject of prayer. We pray for all sorts of things. Think of the things I might pray for myself. My health, it's not that important really, compared to other people being saved. You know, it's not that important at all. Those that live in Let's, sin needn't pray anymore. They needn't pray. Those that live in sin needn't pray anymore. Well, they need to be saved. They need to repent and yeah. pray for God to forgive their sins. But they, they living in sin, they can't pray anymore. Well, they need to turn to the Lord and yeah. ask for forgiveness. Yeah, there's all sorts of sin, not just cohabitation, lots of sins. So, this is the prayer. Uh, the, this is the sense of this prayer. It's a heart's desire. It's no lukewarm prayer. This is a heart's desire and prayer. Very sincere. What is our heart bothered about? Are we really bothered about people that are lost? I think it's most challenging. Now, that they might be saved. We said it's necessary. Now, how are people saved? I'm going to put to you that prayer is vital. Some people have been saved and they can trace back that particularly that it was the prayers of others. Not always the case. We don't always know who's prayed for who. Someone might be praying for the people of our town, the people of our city, and you're saved as a result, partly as a result of that. Of course, salvation is the work of God, and that's why it's tempting not to pray. Well, if God, God's almighty, he can save people. I don't need to pray, but that's not the sincere Christian's way that we see here in this chapter and now there are things that accompany salvation things that happen at the same time so let's pray for those things as well when we pray for the people to be saved let's pray for the other matters that we see here in this chapter and I'm not going to take them quite in order as they come because I want to come back to the next bit at the end but I want to go on to verse 9 it says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I love the word saved. Uh, are you saved? I'm, if I'm saved, I could say I really couldn't care less about anything else. I'm saved. I'm saved. That's the one thing that counts. If you're, in a, if you're in a stormy sea and you're floating around in the sea, you're going to drown, you just want to be saved. doesn't matter what you're wearing, doesn't matter what your hair looks like, be saved. Get on that lifeboat and be dragged up by someone wearing a fluorescent orange coat, dragging you up with a hook into his helicopter or whatever it is, and be saved. Don't fight it, don't resist it. But you just confess the Lord Jesus with the mouth. Now this is shorthand, I agree, it's shorthand language here for what it is to believe the gospel, that God has raised him from the dead. There's a very fundamental thing, that Christ died. But uh, It's implied here, isn't it, that he'd raised him from the dead. He died. He died a sacrifice for sin, a full and sufficient sacrifice for sin. This is what people need to believe, that their sin is so serious, that the only way to be saved is by Christ dying in their place the death that they deserve. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was able, fully able, to, to suffer himself mm. all of the, uh, as a substitute for all the sin of all his people. Now, I, I, we, we can't comprehend that, but his blood washes sin away absolutely faith in his blood that he died for me that is what we need to to do and to turn to him obviously with now it's not even implied in here really that there's a repentance but there must there's a repentance we it, we don't just there, there's a type of easy believers that says just say these words say uh, I believe that Jesus died for me I believe that I'm a sinner but and, and you'll be saved it says that just confess just say this with your mouth 
and believe it in your heart. But, but truly, for this to be happening, God must be working. God must be working in someone. Because we've seen that in the last chapter, there's a lot of people not called. There's a calling of God, an election of God. There's a work of God. God's choosing. God's will. Not man's running. God's showing mercy. Uh, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God is merciful. A person is only saved because God is merciful to them. So there must be a sense in trusting Jesus Christ that he's been merciful to me, a sinner. And so therefore I'm, I'm aware that my sin would lead me to hell. And I, I, I seek to be free from sin and to live for God and to live in his ways, to walk in his ways. There must be a sincerity in this belief. It's not just a trick to say, oh, I believe in this, therefore I'm saved. The heart is concerned. I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm worthy of God's condemnation. But in Jesus Christ, it's all been done. He's raised him from the dead for our justification. So whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Uh, it says, uh, verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. It was quoted at the end of chapter 9. Referring to those who, at what the stumbling stone and rock of offence, they believe on this rock, they believe on this Lord Jesus Christ, and are not ashamed. We'll be ashamed, wouldn't we, of our sin? It's terrible, it's horrendous. It's a sinfulness, disobedience to God, selfishness, ignorance, um, animosity towards others, um, uh, pride and uh, jealousy of others, envy of others. Lying, stealing, corruptness in our thoughts, bad, evil thoughts, sinful thoughts. And yet, that those that believe on Jesus Christ shall not be ashamed. You think, I'm so ashamed. But we're promised because he completely is a full saviour. Then that shame is removed. It's, it's, um, it's beyond what we could ask or think, the salvation that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So pray, as we pray that people will be saved, we're praying that they will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all their hearts and and the belief that he's died and, and raised for their sins and that he is their righteousness. This is, the, this is what we're to be included in our prayer. Now, how shall they be saved? as well as our prayers, generally, they how shall they believe? How shall they call on him and be saved? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, where, how are they going to know how to do that? How are they going to know about Jesus Christ? And it says there in verse um, 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him on whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And so uh, there needs to be preaching. We need to pray for preaching. When we're praying for people to be saved, pray that they'll understand and believe on the Lord, they'll have an awareness of their sin, that it's so serious to live separate from God, but, to, but that they will hear the preaching of the gospel. Now, it's not easy today, in a way, to hear the preaching. People are not looking out, they're not going out to find preaching. So preachers need to go out to people. Uh, we need to call people to come and hear preaching, come and hear about Jesus Christ here, or in some other place of worship. And we can talk to people, even there's a type of preaching which isn't a full, say, full-blown preaching, but it's ordinary Christians talking to other people that uh, and that brings them then on to hearing more preaching and to believe the gospel the gospel of peace and the glad tidings so that's another part of being saved to be saved people need to hear they need to believe and call upon the Lord and they need to hear and 
that that they might be uh, that they might be saved. Now, in verse sixteen, there is a question here put out. It says, well, it says in verse seventeen, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, either the preaching of the gospel, reading of the Bible, reading of tracts, hearing people speaking. But it says in verse sixteen, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. To obey the gospel is to believe the gospel. Mm -hmm. For Isaiah said, Isaiah or Isaiah, as the Old Testament calls, is, is, spells his name, Lord, who hath believed our report? See, it's right, so they've got to hear preaching, but when they hear preaching, they've got to believe it. And this is where prayer comes in, that when we preach, people will hear and believe. Um, they, then they will confess that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so you see prayer is very much of the matter here because so many just don't seem to believe so prayer has a place in all this here in, um, in Isaiah there chapter 53 it's prayer to have and half um? it's prayer yeah Isaiah 53 verse 1 says who hath believed our report this is being quoted it's as if to say well this is a, a, an account in Isaiah 53 of the death of Jesus Christ prophesied by the prophet Isaiah hundreds and hundreds of years before he came and it, it says who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed the arm of the Lord is his strength his power it needs to be revealed to people. So he acknowledges here that there are there are many that do not believe. Now, in chat in the in the following verses, just after this, verse eighteen, it says, "Have they not heard?" Again, asking this question. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So it refers here back to Psalm 19, verse 4. And uh, if we look that up, it's interesting to see that it firstly refers to the stars in the sky. Psalm 19. And you think, well, you can't be converted just by looking at the stars. But, but in that chapter, in Psalm 19, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. And then, if you read going on a little bit, it goes on to verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple so he's actually speaking of the creation of the heavens showing the glory of God and also hearing the word as well but they have heard then it's gone out this message has gone out and of course to the people the Old Testament Israel they had many great signs and wonders and a great history of God's revelation to them. We read in the beginning of chapter 9 the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises, the fathers. But the whole of the Old Testament was a great account of God's work with his people. So how could they not believe when Jesus Christ comes? It seems most strange. They haven't heard. But then it quotes in verse 19 sorry not to hear him properly no the they're not or you're not they're oh not. good you are though yeah. yeah but I say did not Israel know first Moses said verse 19 chapter 10 we're back to sorry we're back to Romans 10 uh, but I say did not Israel know first Moses said I will provoke them to jealousy 
that are no people and by a foolish nation I will anger you but Isaiah or Isaiah is very bold and saith I was found of them that saw me not I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me but to Israel he saith all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people so here the Apostle Paul understands some of the other things that are happening there's a jealousy made uh, quoting from Deuteronomy 32 I won't turn it up now but that verse 19 is referring to Deuteronomy 32 verse 21 that the people of Israel will be made jealous by a people that are no people a foolish nation because the heathen will become Christians some of them become Christians as that's more fully explained in chapter 11 which we'll look at another time but then so that's one of the aspects one of the reasons that they haven't yet all believed is because first of all God is doing this work with other nations Gentiles and he's going to as it were make them jealous now this this can happen to uh, happen in families uh, even among it didn't, it's not just a question of Israel that happening but sometimes there's a Christian in the family we spoke a bit about it this morning and the jealousy that Herod had he wanted to persecute the people of God but then the unbelievers can be provoked as it were to jealousy by seeing believers so it's very important that we live not only for God a godly life but for the sake of the unsaved that they it makes them I'd like to I, that, that person seems to have something which I haven't got because they're Christians because they've got well they don't know what it is but it's because we've got the forgiveness of our sins so that rather than having this weight of condemnation hanging over us we've got peace with God we've got the promise of everlasting life it's wonderful to be a Christian you're, we're not having to please men we're not having to have an appearance of anything because we're accepted by God it doesn't really matter too much what people think although we obviously don't want to be embarrassments to people around but we, we're free you see we're free with Jesus Christ we've got life we're alive we're not dead in sin we're not living under the pretense of trying to pretend we're righteous we admit we're sinners we're saved by the grace of God it's a freedom that the Christian it's the liberty of the children of God it's not a liberty to do evil but it's a liberty from that horrid condemnation that is yucky and makes you feel like you're you're useless you're no good for anything but you're accepted in Jesus Christ the believer is accepted and this is this sets the Christian apart and the world will try and pick at it they try and pick faults with it but we, we, we seek don't we in Jesus Christ to live godly to live with a thankfulness for his salvation and being merciful to a sinner and so the world sees this and they can be as it says here jealous of a foolish person has been saved they've got eternal life the world s s scoffs at it they're jealous of it but it can then provoke them to such a point that they'll turn to Christ that's that's that that's the Christian one great thing that the Christian can be doing you you, you may think everyone's mocking and laughing but someone may turn around and say well actually I could do I could do with your savior and that's what we long for don't we as Paul prays for his people he sees that as part of one of the things that will happen and he also says there in verse 20 it did, so his prayers are rather caught up with this he sees all this big picture but he keeps praying his desire is that they will be turned with jealousy that they will turn to the Lord that be, 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 because they look at him with hostility the, the, the Jewish people hated Paul they beat him they tried to kill him he had to flee the people that became Christians had to flee but he said no no it's because they're jealous but let's pray that that jealousy will turn into their salvation and then likewise he says he explains it again in chapter 20 with this quote from Isaiah I was found of them that saw me not I was made manifest unto them that asked not for to me, for to me but Israel 
All day long I stretch out my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. God's grace is the way that people are saved. Those that are not looking for God, it comes. He, uh, people hear the message and they're often resistant to it. But when God's grace comes, it works. We saw that with various people in chapter 9. God's grace does work. So however hostile, you may know people, and that's so hostile. Someone used to be quite hostile in here towards us, I remember, some years ago. And now he sits here, glad to hear the gospel. And we're not, I mean, he's just not embarrassed about it, are we? We just thank God. It's wonderful that these things change. So how much should we pray like the Apostle Paul did with a heart's desire that these people will be saved? Don't be put off by the worst people. Don't be put off if they're the most hard-hearted. These are often the people that God will save. They look foolish. They look ridiculous. They are the most disobedient, the most gainsaying people. They're not looking for God and they're jealous and they hate Christians and God delights in nothing more than saving them and converting them. So pray, pray for them that they'll be saved. This is, we, we, who, who is, there's one man I think of, I thought I would just, I pray that he'd be saved, the most vile person. Let's do that. Now, this brings us to our last point and it's, going back a bit in the chapter how the Apostle Paul knows this he knows it from his own personal experience he was the most opposed to Jesus Christ he persecuted the church he, he was a Jew that was proud of being a Jew who hated Jesus Christ and he hated people that loved Jesus Christ he hated people for whom Christ had died. He did exactly what it says in Romans 10 here, chapter, verse 2 and onwards. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. This is what Paul was like. Very zealous. He was zealous above all the others in trying to establish his own righteousness. As, uh, similar as, as we read about in the end of the previous chapter but here it is for they being ignorant of God's righteousness ignorant of Jesus Christ the righteous saviour and going about to establish their own righteousness trying to just do various things it was never the way that it was meant to be it was not the way that Moses taught it though he describes it it was not the way to go but there was a righteousness of faith not to ascend into heaven Christ has done that or to descend into the deep Christ has done that but the word is nigh thee the word is in thy mouth it's near thee the word of faith which we preach it was in Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul who was not submitting himself to the righteousness of God verse 3 they've not submitted themselves unto the righteousness for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Now I'm not going to explain these words precisely. To everyone that believeth. Jesus Christ. That there is salvation. Jesus Christ. And him alone. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who died. Who rose again. Who is God the Son. The full, perfect, righteous Son of God. It is by faith in him alone. By faith alone, in Christ alone, it's the grace of God alone, it's to the glory of God alone. And the Apostle Paul knew that once he was ignorant, he was as opposed to Jesus Christ as anybody was, and it was someone else's desire that he will be saved. And he was saved. I believe this that does answer that prayer of uh, Stephen in Romans oh, after days, chapter I 7. Uh, uh, no, sorry, sorry uh, in, in, in Acts 
back in Acts there. Acts chapter 7 when he cried, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. As he was being stoned to death and Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul was complicit in the murder of Stephen. And yet Stephen is praying, Lord, forgive them. And Paul is there, Saul of Tarsus, watching this man being cruelly died for faith in Christ, hating him. And yet this prayer for him to be saved is being issued. And so it happens. And it's a wonder, wonderful salvation that came. The Apostle Paul then was able to live for Jesus Christ, to bring salvation to countless numbers, to take the gospel from Antioch to all around Turkey and into Greece. And from there it spread to all around the world and came to us here. He did more and more because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew what it was to not have this fake righteousness of his own, but to have the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ that's full and sufficient and to be saved and to know he was saved and to know that it was all the grace of God because though he was so hostile you remember what happened on the road to Damascus Paul didn't decide well that's it I'm going to become a Christian no he was struck down God worked Jesus Christ appeared as one to one uh, in a strange time when he'd already really he already ascended into heaven, his last appearance, the Apostle Paul, that Damascus Road experience, and he knew then, this was his Lord. He, knew, he heard he was called to obey him and to live him and to serve him. For some so reason, his prayer was answered. For some reason, he had a sort of, a sort of experience. Yeah, he experience. had, his, his, the, the conversion of, the, of Saul of Tarsus was a very great conversion, but the conversion of everybody is a very great thing. It's something that God does. Yes, they are to confess. They are to call upon the Lord. They are, they, it generally happens by hearing preaching. It may happen by jealousy towards believers. It, it, and it often happens when they're not seeking. They're not even seeking. But some strange thing comes upon them and God draws them and in all this, the prayers of the people of God, it can work in various ways. God works by the Holy Spirit. We pray for this work of the Holy Spirit in converting souls, in convincing them of sin, in convincing them of Jesus Christ. And perhaps one of the important reasons to pray is that when we do meet people who are lost, when people come to church, who are not converted. Our heart's desire, our burning question is, are they saved? Are we able to help them? Can we encourage them in the things of Jesus Christ? Can we speak well of our salvation? Do we have a testimony to share with them that we, we were once lost, now we're saved by the blood of Christ, by his righteousness? Or may it be our prayer. May we not be discouraged we may have some people in our families, our neighbours, people that we work with, people that we know, who seem very, very hardened. Like they're getting more and more hardened. But we don't know the end. But let us be sure that our heart's desire is not for anyone to end up dying and going to hell. But our desire, our heart's desire, our fervent desire is for them to be saved. May we, well, we offer up their sinful uh, ways. They must give up their Yeah, yeah, they must repent. They must repent. Otherwise, it's useless for them praying. Yeah, yeah, they can't pray now. They, they didn't can't pray. pray anymore. Yeah, yeah. Let it be our hearts as as it was with Paul in chapter 9 there. I have the great heaviness, continual sorrow in my heart. I don't find this very much today in the church, that there is a real heaviness. And so, of course, we have a joy in the Lord. We're, we should, if we had more joy, actually, in our salvation, we would no doubt have more heaviness and sorrow for the lost. If we really loved the Lord Jesus Christ and appreciated what it was to be saved, 
you will, I'm sure, have more desire, heart desire, for others to be saved. Uh, we, we pray that others will join our church. We pray that, other, that we get the other Christians in here. But God can do great work on someone in a short while who's lost. They see the difference between being lost, and being, being a sinner under God's wrath, to suddenly the wonder of being saved by Jesus Christ. And they can grow and love the Bible and learn quickly. And so the Lord can do wonderful things. Let us be people, as we said this morning, of prayer. As we were praying, they were praying for Peter to be released. Continual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And now here, also pray that they might be saved. People say, oh, pray for me. I've got a bit of a cold. Yes, but are you saved? I'll pray for you to be saved first and then I'll pray for your cold. I think I tell people that. They need to be saved. Saved from sin. Saved from hell. Saved from ourselves. And to be saved unto everlasting life. It's a, it's a great ministry to seek the salvation of souls. Those that win as souls are wise. We may be discouraged. It may seem like slow work, but keep that your heart's desire burning for souls to be saved. We long and desire God to revive his work and to save many. The, the very, it's the only, only solution, as it were. The answer isn't in the, the political world. The answer is in people being saved. That's the big change that happens when God comes into the heart gives a new heart, washes away sin, gives us a new desire, that the, the only desire we can have to love and serve God comes from being saved from our sins. <coughs> Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, O oh Lord, we are so wondrously thankful for thy great salvation, for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, the Saviour of sinners. He will save his people from their sins because he's called Jesus, the Lord, the Saviour. What a wonderful name it is, Jesus, our Saviour. We thank thee that he loved us and gave himself for us, all that believe on him, to save us from our sins, to save us from the wrath of God and to show us the love of God and everlasting life. We thank thee that he is good and full and perfect in his salvation that salvation is of the Lord and it's all of grace and Lord we see the things that are needed that people need to confess Jesus Christ to repent of sin they need to hear the word of God but Lord we pray that when the word comes to them it may not be to all the savour of death unto death but it may be to many the word of life the savour of life. To hear of Jesus Christ is to hear of life, forgiveness and blessing and righteousness and the love of God in Jesus Christ. What a wonderful God we have, Lord. We thank Thee and we pray that Thy name may be honoured and glorified even in our poor words of preaching. Lord, may the Lord Jesus Christ be honoured and may the sound of the gospel be sweet and pleasant to those that hear and may many be turned from sin unto life from death unto life in the lord jesus name we pray be merciful to us lord give us patience with those that are hard hearted and opposed and uh, 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 and that rage or almost rage at the news of the gospel of Christ of a way of salvation of the desperate state of sin they hate to hear it some Lord but may they be awoken from this deadness and made alive unto God O oh Lord we pray give us a heart's desire Lord there's many things that catch up the desires in our hearts but may our heart's desire be for Israel and for all thy people, that they may be saved, 
Oh Lord, what a wonderful salvation. What a wonderful God. What a treasure it is to know that we're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.